Mr. John Alpert. Yeah, thank you all for staying so late. I really appreciate it. Um, I think it's time to embarrass somebody. So uh, there's one person here who, who Keiko and I know, before we started making this film, there's only one person in the audience, and it's our borough president, Gail Brewer, who has uh, just, just won re-election. Uh, and, 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 wait, I'm, I'm getting to the movie. And if we, w we would have had public servants like Gail, Maybe I never would have been interested in going to Cuba because we would have been happy here uh, in the United States. So Gail's been, um, I don't th you've, have you ever missed a movie that we made? Uh -uh. Never. Okay. And I was watching She Didn't Fall Asleep. So um, Dave Manessas and Moses Naranjo, the editing team, are hiding Woo! in the back there. <laughs> Keiko's hiding over here. And... Katarina helped with the translation. One of our board members, Pierre Bastide. Uh, who else is here from DCTV? You, Max. All over here. Okay, I can't even see who's all, everybody from. Oh, is, that, is that Elena over there? You got Max over there. Yes, Elena and Max, everybody from DCTV. Um, and our architect, who's uh, building uh, the new DCTV cinema next Woo! year at this particular time. Uh, we're going to open the doors and, and come on down. So does anybody have anything they'd like to talk about uh, after I thank Netflix? Uh, Netflix um, it's pretty interesting to work with. Um, <laughs> they said, um, what resources do you need to, to tell this story? And I said, what? I said, nobody's ever asked me that as an independent film. This is what do you need? And, and um, you know, with all the thousands of hours of our archival footage and trying to restore, uh, we, we really needed their support, and we couldn't have been able to do this without them helping us. That's so great. What I think this film is, is, a, is as much um, a portrait, a romanticized, but beautiful and truth and honest and contradictory, all the great things that I also admire about Cuba portrait, but it's also a great portrait of you and your wor the work that you do and how do you interact with people and, and how the camera is this beautiful way for you to bridge gaps and to offer love and to understand um, human beings. And it's, it's such a beautiful film about the way you've tackled filmmaking in your career. Um, what, was, what was it? about making this film that was so personal and emotional? Because I feel there's like a level of emotion in your relationship to these beautiful humans in Cuba that you befriended throughout your life. Well, it, I mean, it's emotional. They're, they're my friends. Yeah. Uh, and I spent more time with them than I did maybe with my family, maybe than I should have. Uh, and my life was wrapped up in their lives for all these years. You know, I was rooting for them and it really hurt uh, when, when they had tough times down there. Yeah, and I really love how, because I've been like also for the last 20 years traveling to Cuba a lot from Spain and having right. like different perspectives on it. And I think you've touched upon all the issues and all the all the times that the one comes back and sees how much worse this got for them and, and how like the beautiful image of the kid with, you know, crying for the death of Fidel Castro with the Coca-Cola hat. It's just we, such... We, we couldn't have dressed him better, could we? <laughs> Oh my know, God! How did I mean, we're, 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 that was like a long day, maybe like a ten-hour filming day, and um, I need an end to this movie. I need an end. To, this kid has a Coca-Cola cap on, and he has a, a Cuban flag. It and was he's like crying for Fidel's right. death. Yes, oh. uh, there are documentary gods up there. Sometimes that smile on you. Oh my God! I was happy to see a bunch of dogs in the film. I know how you important. You think I like dogs? Is. Nah. Oh, okay. Any questions? Yes. Like, when did you decide that you were gonna, that this was gonna be, um, what is it, a 40-year trajectory? Uh-huh. Um, I mean, in the early days, did you know that it was gonna come to that, or? So, so when did, did I decide to, like, that this was the film? Um, if I was smart, I would have figured this out in the beginning. 
But in the beginning, well, you save all the tapes. You took care of them. That was smart. No, no, but there, there's a problem. You don't. We, we're we're like masking some of the problems. We had a catastrophic flood at DC TV once, um, and unfortunately, our entire arc archives got washed away and wa there there's some really really nice scenes that I remember because um, you never forget what you filmed yeah. and I, I actually continue to mourn what got washed away in that flood so we we save everything um, we don't store it under very good conditions. Where's San Sandra? She's, she, she's uh, got an, uh, an archival. <laughs> there she's over there. Okay, she's trying to help filmmakers restore. Oh, and your film. Give give her all your films. We didn't do this, and so our films have been deteriorating over the years. In the beginning, um, often I was the camera of record. So when things were happening in Mariel Bay or Fidel was going to New York, I was the the only camera to see this. Even the Cubans sometimes weren't allowed to film this. Yeah. But you saw the footage from Mariel Bay. We managed to get there and nobody else did. And when this footage showed up on American television, Jimmy Carter, to his horror, realized that Fidel had tricked him and had sent all these nasty characters. 15 minutes after the report was on the air, he stopped wow. the boat lift and more or less quoted from, from our report. And what I didn't know is that there were 300,000 people in a holding pattern who had declared that they wanted to go. And, and when you say you want to go, you jeopardize your house, you jeopardize your job. You're not welcome back. You're not welcome. But they had to all be reabsorbed oh, back into the thing. And they needed somebody to blame. And so Juanito, who used to be everybody's favorite, all of a sudden um, is not getting any special treatment. And so the things that I could get access to, I couldn't get access to, but nobody could keep me from my friends. And so that was the moment when I thought, I'm going to try to tell the story through the story of my friends and we're just going to watch everything through, through their eyes for as long as it takes. And so didn't, didn't think of it in the beginning. It took a while. It worked amazing though. Like your friends are incredible. They're nice friends. They're, they're the, really, really wonderful The friends. Borregos will be forever in our hearts. Um, yes. Thank you. So there's all these uh, like theories about like economists and other people about the effect of Americanization on Cuba. Mm -hmm. So how would you say um, it's effect, it overall it affects the culture of the Cuban people and their standard of living? Because it seemed like there was one or two scenes in the movie where it just felt like their standard of living um, was slightly higher than it was before. Now, I was wondering mm -hmm. if you talk more about um, the impact of people now and where do you think, what do you think the impact would be maybe 20 years from now um, of Americanization on Cuba. So uh, our two countries have always had uh, very close um, brother-sister, brother-brother relations. Um, and there was a really unnatural separation that was caused by the blockade. The purpose of the blockade was to try to force the Castros out of power and to change the system didn't work very well. Uh, you know, if you had a car and you wanted to drive from here to 42nd Street and you got in the car every single day and it didn't go, would you get in the car every single day for 50 years and think that it's going to get you uptown? The thing that worked most effectively in terms of um, opening up the society, making people think differently, was contact with the United States, with our culture, uh, the spoonful of sugar that from time to time we, we, we used down there was very, very effective. That was the thing that provoked this whole Mariel Bay thing, was not the blockade, but was the visits of the relatives and them seeing what was going on in the United States, uh, which makes it really um, troubling and somewhat uncertain that we're, we're going to go backwards now with some of the new initiatives of this administration. Uh, and we're sort of, it's a panacea to the sort of, I think everybody's account discredited Cubans down in Florida. We're going to reassume those policies at this particular time. Uh, and it's a critical time for Cuba because Raul has term limited himself. And he's leaving power officially in the beginning of March. And if you were to ask me, do I know what's going to happen? I don't have the slightest idea. I have no idea what's going to happen. 
Well, the hotels and the banks are going to take over, just like they've been trying to do all along. Well, our, hotel, our hotels or their hotels? European hotels, these hotels, uh, everybody's hotels. I, I don't know. You know it, it, it's really, really hard to say. But one of the things we wanted to communicate in the film is that whatever's going on officially, the Cuban people figure out their own solutions. Luis uh, has, has, has got a way to improve himself bit by bit by bit by bit through his own ingenuity and his own improvisation. It's sort of how we made this film, because we went through 40 years without anybody supporting us and vacuuming the nickels and dimes from the couch and figuring out how we're going to shoot this and how we're going to shoot that. So I have a, a little bit of an empathy with him. Inventando. That's mm -hmm. what they say. Yes. yes. The scene when you were in the play with Fidel and they checked his papers, etc. Did you ever find out who had actually requested that? Was it the United States government? I think it had to be planned as an insult to him. Um, and they basically sent this very, very low level uh, employee onto the plane to humiliate him. But it was a presidential thing? Or? I don't know who gave that particular order, but this guy obviously came onto the planes with orders to humiliate Fidel and tried really hard. Fidel was angry. Woo. Was that ever allowed in the news before today? So some of these scenes, I mean, we would film um, that and throw the, the, the film down the gangplank of the plane and they'd get raced over to NBC News and they'd start editing it and then I'd show up at 2 in the morning. So a lot of that was seen on NBC at the time. Mm -hmm. We have a question over here. So John, how do you come to terms with Fidel, the person that you know and the historical Fidel? I think the, there's more than one Fidel. Um, you know, I related to my father in many, many different ways. I relate to you in many different ways. I like Woody, but he hasn't passed me the puck on the hockey team. And what, like, what was the last time you gave me a pass, Woody? I still like you. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to, to show the many different sides uh, of Cuba, the many different sides of Fidel, but I'm concentrating at least with Fidel on a side that other people can't see. Um, there have been many films, there have been many books that analyze him from an economic point of view, a social point of view, um, and I didn't want to, and I'm not smart enough to be able to do that, so I'm trying to show an aspect of him that people normally wouldn't get to see. Okay. Yes, question right there. Well, we're, we're, we're going to show this at the Havana Film Festival, which Ooh. I'm very uh, excited about. And so if anybody wants to come. Um, yes. So is Jasmine still here? No, she left. OK, all right. So um, we, we sort of uh, put her and, and Sade at DCTV in charge of the, of the group. Maybe you'll come with us, Gail. You want to go? OK. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but. And if, do I have another Cuban film in me? Uh, I, I might not have another Cuban film in me. I've got some other long-term projects that um, have also gotten themselves nursed along, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to bring them into the editing room as well. But I don't know what else to say about Cuba after this. I think, um, I think this, is, this is what I like to say. It's beautiful. Right here. Uh, the, the music. The music. Um, I think the music was terrific, especially since I didn't have anything to do with it. There's always the, the danger. What, what's the danger, David? Uh, there's many dangers, John. Yes. But the biggest danger is my desire to control everything. To play my trumpet as part of the track. Ah. So, so um, in the last documentary, there are a couple of um, very, very much out of tune notes um, that, that David was nice enough to bury very deep in the track, so you, you can't tell. Um, but this music comes in, in two parts. The original songs um, are done by Daniel Freiberg. He lives in, in Yonkers. Um, he's an uh, Argentinian, he has a terrific jazz band, and he did all the original uh, music. And Jonathan Zalbin has been music supervisor on the last uh, three DCTV documentaries, and he's very, very clever at finding 
music at reasonable prices. Everybody said, Buena Vista Social Club. We said, yeah, boy, $30,000 a song. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we, we, we made our own. So thank, thank you for noticing the music. Those guys did a great job. Yeah, that's great. Question again? Yeah. Yeah. Did the Castros consider um, opening up the country? I, I was always moved by the fact that with Gorbachev, the hu huge Soviet Union decides that communism hasn't worked for them. Right. But little Cuba, you know, digs in even harder. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if they ever considered. So, um, I, I don't, she, she wondered, um, did the Cubans consider other pathways after the Soviet Union collapsed? The Russians went off in one direction. Um, it, what were the Cubans thinking? And, and I'm not sure I know the exact answer to that, but I think what I'd like to say is that um, we had a terrific opportunity when they started the Cuban Revolution to sort of stand back and to observe this as a laboratory. We were doing this, um, we, we use Cuba as a laboratory for other things, like for example, the first color television and the transmission of color television. And speaking of that, uh, Sony, the representatives of Sony are here, and we couldn't have done this without Sony letting us battlefield test all their new cameras. Every single form of recording known to humankind is in, the film. is in this film. Uh, and so you filmmakers can see this, and you remember those good old days and the bad old days of the spaghetti making machines. Uh, you take your eyes off the machine, and all of a sudden, there's a 10 foot tall mountain of, of spaghetti there instead of your tape. But if we just sort of step back and said, okay, they want to try this. Let's see what works and what doesn't work. Instead, every single chance we kicked them in the shins, every single chance we chopped off their hands, every single chance, you know, when the Cuban economy was doing well in 1977, this is the part of the film that you missed, but the Cuban economy was really, really doing well, and every year was better and better and better. The United States said, you know what? We know how to fix this. And we took and we dumped our sugar reserves on the open market and crashed the sugar price, and that was the end of the upward movement and they never recovered. And because Fidel every, you know, every time we're socking him, I think it got him into a, sort of a, a rigid defensive posture and one that would not allow him to try something else because damn it, you're not gonna knock me over and I'm gonna do this this particular way. And I think that whole thing is a tragedy. Because uh, maybe they would have found a way and we could have adopted some of the things that they might have been able to make work. Instead, the economy's been running on fumes for the past 40 years. Well, it's in, from the European perspective, I mean, we've all gone to Cuba and sold things to Cuba and like buy things from Cuba whenever we could. But it was, the, it was the, very strange for us to see the devil market morality that happened. Where like people had were living on rations still, but everything like it was the black market that was supporting everything, and it was the tourist uh, economy that was supporting everything. So in fact, Cuba was open; it was open f to the rest of the world, and we were all traveling there on holidays. Um, but it was like a very. Um, it, it was in denial. It's like we don't really want to acknowledge this economy that is making things work now. But it was a very uh, trickster economy because it was only benefiting very few people. And, it was, and, it was and, a and, weird experiment. And, and I watched that same thing happen uh, when the Soviet Union fell. Um, I was standing on a corner looking for a taxi cab. There was in Moscow. No taxi cabs around. It was really, really cold. And uh, all of a sudden, this car stops. And the guy motions for me to come in says it's gonna cost me a dollar for go from here. And he was a doctor. Mm -hmm. And he was he, he happened to have a car and he was augmenting his income with his car. And in the early part of the revolution there was a big fight. How do you stimulate the sort of altruistic mentality so that I'll work for you because I want you to do well and you'll work for me because it benefits the society and we don't have materialistic incentives. I don't work for money, mm. I work for the greater good. And, and that was uh, the big fight that uh, Che Guevara was having with some of the other people and one of the reasons why Che left is he lost the fight. Mm -hmm. 
But once you start thinking about yourself, once Luis steals the tile so that he can sell it, mm -hmm. and he diverts state property to himself, it's a cancer that gets into the country. I'm not saying good or bad cancer, yeah, but yeah. it's a cancer that spreads, and, and that's it. It's over. Mm -hmm. For sure. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I know that uh, just in the past like five or 10 years, have the city of Havana has changed a lot. Um, do you think the other towns and villages in the rural areas of Cuba have changed as well? Or it, are the houses, the culture, and that, like the economics of the village and towns pretty much the same? So I haven't traveled that much, but um, I don't think that they've changed uh, substantially. You can still, if you have dollars, buy things that the normal people can't buy on an everyday basis, and that would be all over the island. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that once you sort of leave the major metropolitan areas, you're falling off a cliff. Uh, and they're still plowing with oxen. I mean, if you go back there, it's like the way we we, we plowed North Dakota 200 years ago. That's the sort of level of the economy. It hasn't really improved at all. Well, thank you so much, Juanito. Thank you so much for coming.